All right, part two. <laughs> so the veins are going to be basically the same as the arteries. So if we know the veins going from the dorsal pedis vein, going from the anterior posterior tibial vein, the fibular vein, the femoral veins, the common iliac veins, the external iliac veins, they're all the same except for we have some extra veins that we don't have arteries for. On the inner superficial thigh and leg, we have the great saphenous vein, which drains blood into our femoral vein. That's one of the extra veins. We actually have more veins in our body than we do arteries, okay? Our common iliac veins are going to come together and form the inferior vena inferior cava. Vena cava. And if we think about our veins, the veins of the lateral abdomen are different than the veins on the left and the right. The right side goes directly into the inferior vena cava. We go left go right gonadal, inferior vena cava. Right uh, lumbar, inferior vena cava. Right renal, inferior vena cava. Right adrenal, inferior vena cava. The left side of the lateral veins likes the <coughs> renal vein. The left adrenal dumps into the left renal. The left lumbar dumps into the left adre renal. The left gonadal dumps into the left renal. So everything dumps into the left renal. And when we talk about the anterior veins, what do they all dump into? The hepatic portal. So we talk about the splenic vein, the gastric veins, the, uh, um, the, um, the superior mesenteric vein, the inferior mesenteric vein. They're all going to dump into the hepatic portal, enter the liver, and then leave as the hepatic veins to the inferior vena cava. Okay? From our arms, we have our radial and ulnar veins, our brachial veins, our axillary veins, the subclavian veins. Where the subclavian veins come together with the external internal jugular veins, what do they become? Brachiocephalic veins, and then they come together to form the superior vena cava. So all blood returning to the heart from the body returns by the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava. Okay? Good, 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 good. All right, so what else did we have? What else did we have? We talked about the heart itself. If we said the coronary arteries fed the heart, then what drains the heart? The coronary sinus is going to drain blood from the heart, and it's going to receive blood from the small, the small, the great, and the middle cardiac veins. So the middle cardiac vein, the small cardiac vein, the great cardiac vein, all dump into the coronary sinus and the posterior heart, which then dumps also into the right atrium. All blood returning from the body or from the heart dumps into the right atrium. From there, blood goes from the right atrium into the right ventricle, passing through a valve. Tricuspid. The tricuspid valve. From there, it goes from the um, right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk, going through the pulmonary semilunar valve. From there, it goes from pulmonary trunk into the pulmonary arteries. Okay? Very good. From there, it gets the oxygen from the lungs, get rid of carbon dioxide, and it then takes blood back to the left side of the heart, the left atrium, to the left ventricle, going through the bicuspid or the mitral valve leaving the left ventricle going out the aorta through the, I'm sorry, going through the aorta through the aortic semilunar valve, and then that takes us to the three branches off the arch of the aorta and the ascending aorta arteries. Okay? So that's blood flow through the heart. When we talked about the heart itself. What is the outside of the heart called? The, what type of serous membranes on the outside of the heart? The epicardium, also called the visceral pericardium. Is the heart in a sac? Yes. That's the pericardial sac or the parietal pericardium. Is there a lining on the inside of the heart? Yes. That's the endocardium. Does the heart have a name for a muscle? Yes. yes. That's the myocardium. And are there roughened areas inside these ventricles? Yes. yes. That's the trabeculate carniae anchoring the AV valves in place. We have chordae tendinae, which attach to what? Papillary, Papillary muscles. This would be the interventricular septum dividing the right and left ventricles. The left ventricle is thicker than the right because the left side pumps blood to the body. We call that the systemic circuit. The right side is thinner, calling it the pulmonary circuit. Beautiful. From there, we have an interatrial septum behind all these great vessels. And if we have a hole in the fetus going from the right atrium into the left atrium for a fetal shunt, that hole is called foramen ovale, and we have a remnant called fossa ovalis. We also have another fetal shunt going directly from the pulmonary trunk into the aorta, and that is called ductus arteriosus, which becomes ligamentum arteriosum. Remember, the fetus is inside amniotic fluid, inside an amniotic sac. It doesn't need to get blood to the lungs because the lungs aren't absorbing oxygen. 
So we can bypass some of the lungs because the lungs aren't really functional in the fetus. Okay? Beautiful. Was there anything else we talked about with the heart? Electrical system. We talked about the electrical nodal system. We talked about the SA node located in the upper portion of the right atrium, the AV node towards the middle wall by the, by the tricuspid valve. Into the middle, we have the bundle of pins, which goes down the bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers. And when we have our contraction, it's the bundle of branches, Purkinje fibers, bundle of pins that uh, contracts the ventricles during the QRS wave of our EKG. So we talked about our EKG, we can divide it into three parts, the P wave, the QRS complex, and the T wave. The P wave represents atrial depolarization, or the atria contraction. The QRS represents the ventricular depolarization, or ventricular contraction. And the T wave represents ventricular repolarization, or ventricular filling. Remember, we cannot see atrial repolarization because it occurs at the same time the QRS wave is taking place. When we did an EKG, we did an AVR, AVL, AVF, three-lead EKG, and the patient had to sit very still while we recorded the electrical activity. That right there was called Einhoven's triangle. Okay? When we check someone's blood pressure, we're actually measuring the pressure inside the ventricles during systole and diastole during the working phase and relaxation phase of the heart, and we measure that in millimeters of mercury. The top number is systole, the bottom number is diastole. A good example would be like 120, 120 over 80. If we subtract the two, we get the pulse pressure, which would be about 40. When we take a blood pressure, we need both the stethoscope and the sphygmomanometer. The sphygmomanometer is the tourniquet. The stethoscope listens, and what we're listening to are the sounds of corticoff that occur while the diameter of your brachial artery is under stress while it's returning to its normal size. The first sound you hear with the stethoscope is systole. The last sound you hear is diastole. Okay, so that was the electrical conduction of the heart, how we take blood pressures. If we hear something uh, abnormal in the lung sounds, what was that called with the valve? Murmur. A murmur. And if we hear anything abnormal in the artery, we call that a? Brewy. 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 <laughs> All right. Was there anything else we talked about regarding the heart? Nope. All right, that sounds about it. I hope you guys have a great time. I'll see you guys next week.